Welcome to Thinking Green. I'm Rana, and uh, it's good to be back after our summer vacation. Uh, we're going to have our announcements uh, a little bit low tech. So before I introduce tonight's guests, I'm going to read the announcements. Uh, next week, we'll be back to our regular pre-taped community calendar. But uh, well, we're just getting back into the swing of things after summer. So uh, bear with us. Um, the first thing I wanted to tell people about is that on Saturday, October 10th, uh, will be the third annual Hempstead Far Har Harvest uh, Festival at the Hempstead House in New London, and it'll be from 11 to 5. Uh, there will be music, cider pressing, beer brewing, uh, lawn games, crafts, house tours, and it uh, sounds like a good time. Um, and also on Saturday in the evening at uh, the Bishop Seabury Church in Groton, there will be a performance by the Destiny Africa Children's Choir, which is a choir made up of orphan children who live in Uganda in the Kampala Children's Center. It's free and open to the public, and that also sounds really great. Um, for the whole weekend, um, McCullough Farm in Old Lyme has an open barn um, Foles and Foliage, that's October 10th, 11th, and 12th from 10 to 4. You can kind of come and go as you please, walk around, visit the horses, uh, bring blankets, have a picnic. Uh, it's pretty um, casual, but it's a really nice way to get out of the city. Um, on Sunday, the 11th at 4 p.m., there's a Piano Works concert at All Souls uh, Universal, Unitarian Universalist Church. Um, that's going to be at 4 p.m. And the featured pianist is a 13-year-old pianist named Anna Han. Um, that's at All Souls. On Monday the 12th, uh, there's a performance at Connecticut College, uh, The Laramie Project, 10 years later, an epilogue. And um, you have to contact uh, on stage at Conn College for more information about uh, tickets and times. Oh, it's at 8 p.m. in Evans Hall, but I'm not sure about any of the other details. Uh, the number is 439 Arts. And next Tuesday, October 13th at 6.15, there will be a candidate forum at the New London Senior Center, and uh, it will be the council candidates in New London who are part participating in that forum, which is sponsored by the Neighborhood Alliance and will be moderated by the League of Women Voters. And on Wednesday, October 14th, um, is the um, annual fall food stroll in uh, downtown New London. And you can get buttons through New London Main Street. Uh, that runs from 5.30 to 8.30 PM. And also that same evening at 7 PM, um, at Niantic Cinema, those of you who watched the last show will have more information about this. The film Billboard from Bethlehem will be shown at Niantic Cinema. The filmmaker Bruce Barrett, who founded iwagepeace.org, will be on hand for a discussion afterwards. That's at 7 p.m. Uh, at Niantic C Cinema. And I'm only going to, oh, at Thursday is the Martin Luther King Annual um, Scholarship Dinner. Yeah. Um, that's at 6 p.m. at the Mystic Marriott. And if you need information about uh, where to uh, send payment or get more information, um, leave your name and we can get back to you. And um, there's only one more uh, announcement. And this is actually for a week away, uh, a week and a half away. On Monday, October 19th, the film Rethink Afghanistan is going to be shown at the Otis Library in Norwich from 5 
7.30 to 7.45, and Jeff Bartos from uh, Connecticut Iraq Veterans Against the War will be on hand for the discussion. So that sounded really good as well. So those are, this is what we get instead of a community calendar <laughs> this week. But uh, we'll be back uh, next week with our usual format. OK, our guests um, tonight uh, are Father Emmett Jarrett and Mrs. Eunice Waller. And they're both very familiar people around New London. Uh, and the reason they're on the show is that uh, St. Francis House has just celebrated its 10th anniversary of, of being in New London. And we wanted to talk about what those 10 years have been like uh, for St. Francis House and for New London. Father Emma Jarrett lives and works at St. Francis House and was a founder. And uh, Eunice Waller has been on the board for many years. So I welcome both of you to Thinking Green. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Emma, maybe you can start out just telling us like, how the idea of St. Francis House got started and maybe why New London? Why? Well, a good question. <laughs> um, the, the idea got started because I, I was for 25 years a parish priest in the Episcopal Church and spent a lot of time trying to persuade parishioners and good, well-intentioned Christian folk to, uh, to, to care for the poor and to work together for justice. And at a certain point, it became clear that it would be easier just to do it ourselves than try to persuade other people to do it. And interestingly enough, I, mean, I tell that kind of as a joke, but in fact, working the way we've been working at St. Francis House, doing it ourselves, has, has drawn more people into it than we ever drew into it when I was trying to get parishioners to come and join something in, in parishes all around the country. So uh, we were up here, Anne Scheidner, my wife, grew up in Stonington, so this is, this is home to her. Uh, both of her parents were still alive, her father's dead now, her mom's still alive, and her aunt, uh, who now lives with us, is still alive. So coming here was coming back to family. Uh, I had no interest in going back to Louisiana, um, but I needed a city, uh, even a little city will do. It has to be a city for me. Um, one, of the, one of the things I experienced in 1976 when I went to live in London, uh, we lived within, within earshot of, of Big Ben uh, in one of the quietest areas in the city. And I couldn't sleep for months coming from Brooklyn, New York, <laughs> and until finally I got used to it. And having spent the last few months living in Stonington, uh, recuperating from a cancer surgery, coming back to New London where the streets are noisy, it's, it's easy to sleep. So we came here, we came to New London because it's, it's where Anne grew up. Uh, and we came, we started St. Francis House in order to, to do the work of being disciples uh, rather than just talk about it. So, oh, what is the work? What is the work? Um, that's, that's a very interesting thing because one of, the, one of the problems that we've confronted over the years is, is a, the so-called professional model. Uh, and in the church, the, the minister or the priest is the professional and he or she comes and sort of parachutes in and tells the people how to fix things in their neighborhood. Uh, the classic model though is that the priest lives next door to the church which is in the heart of the community. And so the, the problems of the community are the same problems for the priest and his or her family as well. Uh, so we decided that we were going to come and simply live here and get to know our neighbors and see what, what needed doing. Uh, among the first person we, persons we met were homeless people, but we also had children who went to school, and so we had, we had an edu educational component to that. And we also were concerned with growing our own food, so we began to plant things in the backyard and became involved with community gardens. And we sort of, we got here in 1999, and in 2000, uh, what was it, 2001? 2001. 2001. That's when um, okay. We met a whole us. lot of people. We met a whole lot of people. And so uh, while we've always been uh, committed to peace activism, uh, that wasn't our intent to, to start that. But, but nonetheless, that's, that became a large part of what we do. Now, and that's how we met you. It is. Uh, but before you go into that peace yeah. part, I, I want to say how I got involved with Anne. Yes. Uh, she constantly came to the Board of Ed meetings and she would sit quietly behind me. At that time, I was still involved, uh, and I would see this lady sitting behind me. She came 
regularly to the board meetings and never said anything. So finally I approached her and said, would you be interested um, in serving on the Board of Ed? And she said, well, I, I, I don't know anybody and I'm new in town and um, let me just tell you um, my perspective. And she wrote it all out and then uh, I got uninvolved with politics and I ended up stopping by St. Francis House on a Friday, the Friday that I volunteered at the meal center. I stopped by, they were having prayer and it was peaceful and quiet uh, and I could express myself or not express myself and I got drawn to the peace and quiet and I kept coming back every Friday for the peace and quiet. And so that's how I became involved, getting me uh, interested in the board uh, when they established the St. Francis House. But Anne was my draw, because I thought she would just be perfect for the Board of Ed. I just... <laughs> and she was wise enough to stay out of <laughs> my politics. <laughs> Unlike some of the rest of us. Um, uh, okay, I just so wanted to get in there. How, how, how long have you been involved with the... I've been on the board uh, I, about eight years. About eight years, because I kept coming, and um, the peace and quiet kept drawing me there. Uh, and I met with the group when they when s some citizens met with them and um, decided to organize the board. And I, I, each year I keep saying, I don't have enough time for this board. Mm -hmm. I don't have enough time for this board, but I kept going back. I kept going back. I think the peace and the quiet and the quiet marches, um, standing around the monument, mm -hmm. sort of drew me to that, sort of drew me to that. So I've been with them through at least four elections anyway, back to the board. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Well, one of the things that, that U.S. brings is that when we first got here, we, the board were people that we knew, known from Atlanta and Washington and Boston. Um, but as we got to know people locally, we wanted some people on the board, and Eunice was one of the first. Paul Jacobowski, uh, the head of the food center, who's now, who, who, Paul and his wife Wendy now live at St. Francis House and are part of the community, but he was an early member of the board. And the idea of that is to have a board so that if, if we don't establish a community, uh, then somebody, when we get old and die, will sell the property and give the money to somebody <laughs> who will try to do it, to do the same kind of work. Although we, at this point, we have 11 members living in the two houses, so at different stages of membership. And of course, when you s mention the peace and quiet, I, I think most viewers know where St. Francis House is, but maybe not all of them. It's on 30 Broad Street near yes, the courthouse, near a part of town that most people would not see as a, as a haven of peace and quiet. Well, that's why I, w I became concerned about Anne, because um, the homeless people were sitting on the rails out there, and they were always around. And if they needed help, Anne was right there. If one fell and needed some help, Anne was right there. If, she, if they needed to go to the hospital, she was And I kept saying, Anne, aren't you afraid? And she would say, no, no, no. <laughs> so I kept watching her as she interchanged and, and mingled with the citizens, not fearing anything, because her aunt was down at the hotel at the time, and she walked all the time back and forth didn't seem frightened about anything, and I would get into my house by the time it was dark and close the doors. <laughs> but I got very concerned about Anne. She had such a big heart, and she wanted to be involved, and I was just fearful for her. But she still is not afraid. She walks up and down the street and goes for a walk all the way around and helps anybody that she need, that needs help. Uh, I got fascinated with her about that. I think people do. I, accidents, of course, can always happen, but I think people really do know when you're there to help. Yeah. Um, I spent 12 years home visiting in New London, uh -huh. and I went everywhere. I went places the VNA wouldn't go, places uh, uh -huh. that a lot of other social service agencies wouldn't go without an escort. And I always went alone. And I have to tell you, I really... That going to a house for the first time, I might feel nervous, mm -hmm. but once you know the people who live there, mm -hmm. you, you start looking familiar to their neighbors, mm -hmm. and as, particularly with St. Francis House, and lived there, so yes. she was a neighbor, yeah. and is a neighbor. So um, 
I think that really, that kind of behavior spreads kind of a, a, a feeling of peace all around you. Yeah, yeah. Well, before we get into what St. Francis House is doing in, in more detail, um, those of you who are watching, whenever you see uh, Emmett and Eunice, you're seeing this painting behind them. Yeah. And I thought, um, Emmett, it might be a good time to talk about the painting. All right. Can I, can I walk over there? Yeah. Let's see, let's see if it works. Yeah, I think you're on a tether, but I'm on a tether. I, yeah, but hopefully you, you can get there. Right. There, this, this painting was painted by uh, Anne's and my daughter, Sarah, who is 19 years old. She'll be 20 on Halloween. Uh, and she painted it as an anniversary present for the, the uh, 10th anniversary of St. Francis House. So you, you see, see the, the painting, there's a sidewalk, uh, there's a figure of St. Francis releasing a, a, a peace dove, yeah. releasing a dove, and behind him, all new letters will recognize the, the Wyland <laughs> whale. Um, so oh, it's, it's St. Francis coming to New London, and St. Francis bringing peace to New London, and the, the green growing there, the growing out of the, the sidewalk, and, and life springing up from something that is, that is stone and dead. Um, um, and of course, the, the painting uh, is, a, is a wonderful painting. Sarah and I had lunch together today and went over to take a look at it. There's, it turns out there are three whales and two porpoises in the, the wild whale picture. But it was Sarah's gift to us as a 10th anniversary um, celebration. And the hope, the hope is that, that coming to New London, we bring a gift of, of peace. Uh, but, but it also means that coming to New London, we find the peace that we want to give. Uh, you, you, it's, it's not coming in from somewhere with something outside. It's, it's finding in oneself what it is that one wants to give and finding in the people that one is with what it is that needs to be given and that, that wants to be given. People give us much more than we give them. People give us a, 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 a sense of, of meaning and accomplishment. Uh, the, the, uh, the, the homeless people that, that we have dealt with for all of these years, the first guest, the first opportunity to practice hospitality was with the homeless man who, even before we were able to live in the house, it was a mess. It had been a crack house. And, and uh, <laughs> oh. we had a lot of renovating to do before we could live there. And uh, this one fellow, uh, Melvin, uh, was homeless and was an addict, and uh, he's in, in New Haven now, and still homeless and still an addict. Uh, but nonetheless, wanted to go to SCAD, to the uh, rehab, and uh, I promised to take him, but he needed a place to stay. So he stayed, we both stayed there that night, sleeping on the couch and on the floor, uh, and went the next day. And that was the beginning of our homeless ministry. Not because of a, a, a pre pre-existent plan to do a program, but a plan to be a neighbor. Mm -hmm. So just being in that place at that time, being in that place the answer, time. one and of the answers The came great to thing you. about, uh, if, if, if you live where you work, there's stuff that you can do that you can't do if you don't. So if somebody comes to the house and, and wants a cup of coffee, I don't have to go back home from my office to get him a cup of coffee. It's, it's there. There's always coffee on. Uh, hospitality is, is one of the three things we say we practice. We practice prayer, uh, yeah. which is very ecumenical in its, and, and interfaith in its expansion, in its, in its, uh, in its meaning, although we are an intentional Christian community. Um, and we practice hospitality, in, like with Friday nights and with guests and, and whatnot, uh, but also work for justice, and because we don't have any peace unless we have justice. The, and that, to, to try to be that and to talk about that in New London with people like you, with people who are in, in involved in local politics, people who are involved in national uh, issues, to try to say uh, that, that if, if we do justice to one another, then we will have peace. If we are caring for the people that we meet, then they won't be dangerous to us. That's and, true. and that's something that Anne has learned by experience. It's something that I've learned by experience. It's still hard. Yeah, especially if you don't really know someone, because sometimes the, if, if uh, you were the victim, you wouldn't really be the intended victim. Right. There's a lot of yeah. diffuse anger out there that, that gets mm -hmm. acted out uh, in True. a misdirected way. True. So, you know, many of us could, could find ourselves in its path. But I think that, you know, you can put the odds in your favor by being there to help. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about 
you mentioned prayer is one of mm -hmm. your uh, one of the, the the things that your life is based on. Do you want to talk a little bit more sure. about that? Um, well, as, as, as you know, I'm, I'm an Episcopal priest and a, and a Franciscan. Most people don't know that Episcopalians have religious orders, let alone uh, that we have Franciscans, but, but I am. <laughs> I'm a Franciscan, Paul Jacob Oscar. I would know it if I didn't know you. <laughs> but, but there you are. Um, and so that, that's prayer for us is simply being in the presence of the center of the universe which we believe to be who we believe to, which we to be a, believe to be a who a person, uh, and which we believe to be uh, con con uh, committed to justice. If you read the Hebrew scriptures, um, you, you you get Amos saying, "Let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever flowing spring." It's not about piety. It's not about uh, going off and doing church services. It's about doing justice. It's about caring for the poor. There are three categories in the Hebrew scriptures of people that God has a particular care for. Then there are widows, orphans, and foreigners. And in a male, in a patriarchal society, the widow has lost her husband, the orphan has lost her fa his father or her father, mm -hmm. and the foreigner has no country, no mm -hmm. fatherland, no native land. And so God takes particular care for them. And wants us, his children, as, uh, as uh, people, to do the same kind of thing. And so prayer is a, is, a, is a way of putting ourselves at the disposal of that intention at the heart of the universe for the good of all. And I think about our society today, and I think it is still true, the widows, orphans, and, fo yes, and foreigners, and foreigners yeah. have um, a lot of problems imposed on them beyond what their right. their natural circumstances well, would be. Is not dead. <laughs> no, I, it's alive and well. Um, now you have you you have prayer on a regular basis then. Yes. Right? We have uh, every at eight o'clock every morning, Monday through Friday. Uh, we we have a prayer service with some some scripture readings and some meditations. Uh, Russ Gunlack come, a retired Baptist minister, a good friend of ours comes and prays with us. Um, Deacon Ellen Adams sometimes comes and prays with us. Uh, Eunice is there sometimes. Uh, anybody's welcome to come and do that. It's very simple, not, not, not too complicated. But we also, uh, and some, some evenings from 8.30 to 9, we'll just have quiet uh, time, which we call time for adoration, time to, to let our hearts go out to, to God and, and be quiet. And that's the part I like best. The quiet's the best. I like the peace yeah. and quiet. <laughs> and that's what brought you in and yes. it's keeping you in. Yeah, the peace and quiet. The peace and quiet. But in fact, Eunice, says, uh, Eunice knows a lot about the history of New London. So that, she has helped us to understand the context in which we're living and, and, and trying to work uh, in, incredibly well. She also grew up in the South, as did I. <laughs> and so we have that in common. Well, I came uh, almost 50 years ago, and New England was new to me. It wasn't at all like I had read of it in books. And so I stayed pretty quiet and out of uh, politics for almost 10 years, just observing uh, the life in New England. And I was working in the school system in Waterford. Um, so I studied the history and I watched it and I, I, I've seen a lot of it come and go. When we came, they were just deciding to tear down New London, tear down the old <laughs> houses and put up the new ones. And we had just come from Columbia, Columbia, South Carolina, where Columbia had done it just the opposite because Columbia had the, needed the capital space. But they built the houses outside of the city bought the land, build the houses, and move the people in it, build the school, and then move the people in it before they tore the houses down. And New London did it just the opposite. New London was tearing the houses down, moving these people into other houses, moving them around when there was nowhere for them to go. And we kept trying to say, this is not the way to do it. And, and we would be told, you are new to our city. You can't tell us how to run our city. <laughs> and we would go back in a shell again. <laughs> so, you know, I just watched that. And I still regret that we tore down all of those beautiful homes that we could have remodeled. 
Um, I regret that today, even though they have nice homes to live in. Um, and I watched the city's politics. I, ten years I watched that politics before I got involved um, because I, I wanted to know where the power structure was. I found out where it was. Um, my friends would say, are you going to be a Republican or a Democrat? I said, I don't know. It's, it's whoever's in charge up there. <laughs> that's <what I'm> <laughs> <laughs> so that's how I, I had to study the city. I had to study it a lot. We were new. We were from the South. Um, we were from North Carolina. My husband was at Howard University when we came here. But we were new to New England. So I studied the city and the politics before I got involved. I just studied what was happening. And so I know the history of it very well. Um, I won't mention what's happening today because I'm very <laughs> unhappy about that, but I think that's all a, just a misunderstanding. I think it's a misunderstanding. That's what I, that's what I think. I will be glad when November the 4th is over. Yeah, I will be glad. I'm sorry Me I brought too. that up. <laughs> yeah, we'll go back to a place of peace and tranquility. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Um, now, you started to talk about how you became involved in working with the homeless, mm -hmm. and you know, maybe you can talk Definitely. a little bit about how that started, how that's grown, okay. how it's, the focus might have shifted a little over the years. Oh boy, has it ever. <laughs> uh, the, the, the first thing was getting to know some of the people who were hanging out on, on, the, on the, the dentist's uh, fence wall um, across the street from us and uh, just yeah. getting to know them and, and talking to them and finding out what, what their lives were like. And so then, then we found out that, uh, that there was a, a winter emergency shelter uh, that was run by the city, by the Department of Social Services, Pat Saluka and Marie Gravel. Um, uh, and, and so we, you know, I, I was part of the clergy association group and we decided to get our, ourselves together and got on a committee to help with that. Uh, and began to find out stuff. At that point, um, each winter, the city would provide a house that, usually a house that the New London Development Corporation had bought and was going to either renovate or tear down later. And so they would use it for the winter shelter uh, mm -hmm. and put cots in and, and hire somebody to, uh, to run it. But the, the contract for running it went to the Salvation Army, which was deeply involved in December with their bell ringing, which is their right. annual fundraising campaign. So the shelter didn't open until January, and that struck us as a little strange because it does get cold in New England before January 1st. Oh, well, yes. So you don't have to come from the South to don't know have to that. Come <laughs> the <laughs> so so we, uh, we decided, okay, if we, could, if we get some churches to open up their church basements, so the parish halls, mm -hmm. uh, we can get uh, cots, we can get uh, sleeping bags, and just have, have December at least be covered with volunteers. And so St. James Church, St. James Episcopal Church, and St. Mary Star of the Sea, which were the two churches that 25 years ago started the Covenant Shelter yeah. and that are still oh, I didn't know part that. of the sponsors yeah. of it. That, that's the covenant, the covenant between those two churches and between yeah. um, um, Ralph, what's his, sorry, it's mm. my chemo brain. Um, Ralph, the, I don't know. The, the former rector of, of uh, of St. James, and, and the, the oh, yeah. guy was a priest at, at, uh, at St. Mary's. Um, but anyway, we got these two churches. All Souls Unitarian Universalist Congregation wanted to, but their space wasn't, the fire department wouldn't let us use it. So they provided a whole bunch of volunteers. Those three churches together, we, start, we opened in December, and, and people slept on the, on, the, uh, on the floor. And that was up in the parish halls. And it was up in the parish halls. And then in January, it went back to the regular thing, January, February, March. Um, and by that time, we were just getting more and more drawn in. So the next year, uh, Russ Carmichael, who was at that time part of the Homeless Coalition, uh, and I ran the, the, uh, the shelter, which was at Mount Moriah Fire Baptized Holiness Church, yes, starting in November, in December. Uh, and and, and uh, Pastor Cornish pr provided the church, the space. Uh, it was a wonderful, generous space. But uh, we had 26 cots, and many nights we had 42 people. Whoa. Uh, so we needed yeah, that is space. not a large space. It's not a large oh, space. Yeah. So we needed more space, and that, so we moved to St. James um, the next year. But that was the year that in the summer, um, the, the city abolished its social services department and yeah. no longer had that support or that basis. So 
um, um, what's the name of the uh, sound community services um, mm -hmm. s stepped up, as I said, and, and offer offered to be the, the, cor the, the corporate sponsor of it <clears throat> and to, to channel money that came to us and, and to pay, pay staff. Uh, and, and again, uh, Russ and I ran, ran, ran most of it. Um, but that was, it was really too much for them. Uh, that's, they're, they are, they're, they're, their work is, is mentally ill homeless people, and they do a good job working with, no. with the, health, the mental health part. Uh, but running a homeless shelter is a different kettle of fish, and you have to be—you uh, have to be not afraid, and you have to be somebody who likes the people that you're going to deal yeah. with. The the principle that we operated on, and this was the part that was really really important, uh, is that the people who are there are our guests and our neighbors. They are not our clients. They don't exist to give us jobs, uh, and they are not uh, consumers of the services that we provide. And that's what a lot of social work and a lot of, of, uh, of, of agency work uh, turns into. It becomes a, a, a group of people who, who make their living providing services or providing drugs or stuff, illegal drugs, yeah. to, to, to consumers. Um, and we just take the whole, a whole different attitude. These are not consumers, they are not clients, they are our neighbors and our friends. And we know them by name and they know us. Um, mm. The, um, the, the city, how to, how to say this in a generous way, the city tried to shut us down a number of times and basically didn't like us in the downtown business district. Uh, we felt, and we still feel, that um, when people are in the shelter and a place of rest, they won't be on the street doing things they ought not to do uh, at, at night in the downtown business district. But there it is. We disagree, disagree about that. Um, we are... Uh, we, so we incorporated ourselves. Rob Simmons, who was our congressman at the time, uh, we used to pick at his office all the time about the war, but he was very <laughs> committed to work with homeless people, and he did a wonderful job, and he helped us get our 501c3 from the IRS in two weeks, just like that. Oh my goodness, Beautiful. I've never heard of anything so fast, call. as a matter of at fact. At that point... <laughs> Most people don't believe you can do it that fast. But no. Be, but there, and what you have to do is to say, could you not operate if you didn't have these grants that, that you have to have a, a tax deduction to get. And we could say that, and he called up and told them that, and, and they moved. Uh, so it was great. So he's, uh, and he's still devoted to the homeless and, and, and cares about that, because he's experienced some stuff like that himself. Um, so we set up the Homeless Hospitality Center. And the next stage was to say, uh, it's not just a matter of providing, but by this time we were, we were keeping the shelter open all year long, because people, need a place to sleep all year long, right. not yeah. just in the dead of winter. Um, and, but we also opened the daytime drop-in center to not just provide a place to sleep, a place of safety, important as that is. It's, it's the foundation for us. But then, brought people there, how do we help them get the benefits that they're entitled to? Many people are entitled to Social Security benefits. Many people, some of them are older. Uh, many people are entitled to disability benefits. A lot, some people are mentally ill. Uh, they're in time. Oh, you have quite a few vets as well, and right? And we have quite a few vets. And so uh, the one of the latest things is we have a house that the VA is helping to buy uh, that, that will be provide housing for homeless veterans. Not, not shelter, but housing, actual apartments housing. for veterans who have been, become homeless. When you were talking about St. James, I happened to work at St. James at the time all of this stuff That's was happening. My Head Start classroom was in the basement at that time when the, the shelter was up uh, on, mm -hmm. on the top floor. And I remember being so shocked that um, we had just refused the opportunity to move to TVCCA's Bayonet Street um, facility mm -hmm. because a lot of the, our students lived in the housing on mm -hmm. Federal and Huntington Street and they walked. Yeah. And we didn't know if they'd be able to mm -hmm. get to school uh, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. over you know, the other end of the north end of town. And someone I know who is a wonderful person, I've seen her at the homeless benefit dances, and she's worked in New London with kids of all sorts, and she made some comment you, uh, when the shelter was o open, uh, are you sorry now that you didn't decide to move to Bayonet Street, and the three of us who worked at St. James said, no, no, we're fine. <laughs> and, and 
you know, I have to say that, you know, we, we use the, the facility in the daytime, not at the nighttime, but it never impacted our classroom that there was a shelter right. uh, on the top floor. It, yeah. So people who think that the, um, that the impact, you know, just yeah. from people using that space is going to radiate out, that was not my experience. And most people who come and volunteer at the shelter really have that same experience. They get to know human people as human beings. They're, and they're not so threatening then, and they're not so scary. Um, people can be scary, but people who are not homeless can be scary too. I'm more scared of people who, uh, who <laughs> no throw, throw bombs <laughs> than, than no I am of people who uh, are homeless. But we've now moved downstairs uh, right. and uh, traded places with you. Actually, yes, because Head Start, though I'm not there uh, right now, they moved upstairs. They moved upstairs. And uh, to give them credit, the, the Navy gave us the cots and installed the cots so that people are not sleeping on, on, uh, on, on, the on floor. cots, but on, on bunks, bunk beds, uh, which is great. Well, um, what, what else? I had something else in my. Oh, yeah. What, uh, you mentioned the day center, the drop in center. Yes. What kind of services do you provide okay, there? The services there, uh, for one thing, it's a place to get in out of the cold or the, the rain or the weather. Uh, and have a cup of coffee during the day. Uh, we're open from, from uh, I think, 8 to, to, to 4 or 9 to 5, whatever. Uh, there's breakfast at First Congregational Church five days a week. So a lot of people in the community are involved in caring for and providing for the neediest of our brothers and sisters. Um, but we help people, uh, their computers, people can go online. We help people develop resumes and, and apply for jobs. It gives people a phone number. I mean, if you go, if you want to look for another job, you got to have. Uh, you got to be, have to be, be able, have to, be contacted. Be able to contact you. Uh, so we have a phone that people can give out as their number, and they can make phone calls. Uh, the visiting nurse is there two or three times a week and does ordinary kinds of care, foot care for people who spend most of their, whose tra mode of transportation is walking. Uh, and it just does basic stuff. We, we get, the VNA provides, get, got, gets a grant and pays for that themselves. Um, Mary Lenzini, the head of the VNA, is on, on our board, uh, as are lots of good people. Um, John Russell runs the, uh, the, the, the Homeless Treasures yes. thrift shop, uh, where if you have things to, uh, that you want to get rid of that are usable, we'll pick them up and bring them over to the shop, and then homeless people help to run the shop and make, uh, make a little money, have a job, and sell things, and we will deliver the furniture to you, to your home. And John and Kathy actually were on one of our last shows before we went before off for went off. summer and vacation. John, of course, has raised huge money for, for both Covenant Shelter and the Homeless Hospitality Center for the last three or four years. Just wonderful work. Other people did it this year, but, uh, but John got that started. But also get people a Social Security benefits that they're entitled to. The people at Social Security, right now, there's a man in the hospital who cannot walk, and the Social Security people, because of the work that our HAC mm -hmm. staff has done, building relationships with him, is going to go to the hospital and get the information necessary for him to fill out his forms, forms and apply for the benefits to which he's entitled. And that's yeah. the thing. The bureaucracy makes it hard for people to get things yeah. that they're entitled to. So we try to, to be neighbors and to be friends. And HHC follows that same model of hospitality is the, the operative word in the Homeless Hospitality Center's name, just as it is for St. Francis House. Now, I became uh, aware of St. Francis House, of course, through the Peace and Justice mm -hmm. Network. And um, I think St. Francis House was there together with, with a few of us, um, just kind of thrown together when our country suddenly started, you know, changed overnight, practically. Right. And um, maybe you can talk a little how, how you've been, what you've been involved in related to peace and justice in the area, okay. in a broad sense, not broad just sense. the network. Well, the, the, the network is important because the network meets at St. Francis House, what, the second Monday of every month, which is this coming Monday. At 7 o'clock p.m. And St. Francis House became the, the host for that because uh, everybody else was busy. And so okay. it, it just works out. And so people, people gather and, and, and anybody can come. You're welcome. Uh, it's a network and there are lots of people. And at certain times there are a lot of people there. At certain times it's only a handful of us. Um, the, uh, 
uh, we, we, we've done demonstrations at, at the Coast Guard Academy when, when uh, Mr. Bush and Mr. Cheney and others were, uh, were coming and uh, uh, always, to, always expressing our res respect and support for the graduates of the Coast Guard Academy but our desire to criticize the people who were putting our young men and women in harm's way uh, for reasons we didn't think were good. Um, I've, I've also been involved in, in, in Washington and the, since the opening of the Guantanamo prison camp um, and going down to, uh, to, to, to D.C. To, to make a witness at the White House at the Supreme Court. Two years ago, we shut down the Supreme Court for a day. It's the first time that's ever happened. Wow. Uh, and Great. so we've gone back and gone on trial for that. And at one of the trials, it was a wonderful uh, experience because there were 27 of us who were on trial uh, and 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 we we summarized uh, our our case. So we lost, needless to say, because uh, <laughs> we had indeed gone in and, and uh, sat down. But um, one of the people there was a a a, 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 guy, a man who was a nurse in in rural North Carolina who focused on poor people with HIV and AIDS, and he said, "I am a mandated reporter." under state law. I must report a danger. And so I went to the Supreme Court to report a danger to my country. Wow. Another man uh, was, uh, as I am, uh, an ex-GI, a vet veteran, and he said, uh, 35 years ago I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. And so I went to the Supreme Court to defend the Constitution. And it was just very, very powerful. And of course, they sentenced us all to two weeks suspended sentence. But and we have a phone call. Hi, you're on Thinking Green. Hi, Rona. Hi. Um, I just wanted to call to say that um, I was at the forum the other day where for the board of ed where you were speaking, and there was a lot of good speakers. But you impressed me very much with the things you had to say and the sincerity with which you were saying them. And I just wanted to let you know that you have my vote come November third. Well, thank you very much. Uh, okay, and, and have a great show going too. I'll, I'll talk with you later. Thank you for calling. Bye. Oh, that's great. That, that was a nice call. call. That is that a very nice, nice call. Calls. Thanks for calling. <laughs> you never know what to expect on live TV. No. Um, let's see, what have we missed? We only have about 10 minutes left. So what do you left. want to run for? Uh, Board of Ed. The Board of Ed. Okay. The Board of Ed. I am mm -hmm. going to be on two lines, actually, you won't be happy about this, oh. but I am on the green line, uh -huh. and the Republicans also endorsed me, uh -huh. knowing uh -huh. that I'm not a Republican. So um, my name will be on the ballot twice. Good. We'll see. Um, I, I'd love to serve on the board. I've been mm -hmm. an educator for, a long time. About, for about 30 years at all different age levels, but mostly birth through four. Well, I'm glad he called. I didn't know that. That's good. I, I'm sure I've seen the signs around town. There are a few. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there will be That's a few more, too, but yeah, yes, yes, they're, they're, they're Very sprouting good. Very out. Very good. Uh, back to, to St. Francis House, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you mentioned um, interfaith connections that you've made. Uh, I know the beloved community yes. has been part of that, and I, I thought you might want to talk about that a little bit. That's just what I was thinking of. <clears throat> I looked down here and said, beloved, beloved community. community. Um, yeah, what was it, April uh, the 4th of 1968 yeah. was the date on which Martin Luther King Jr. was assassinated. I would call it martyred because I think he died for, mm -hmm. uh, for the faith for, in the, of the God of justice. <clears throat> um, and so it was 40 years later. So, and, and, and I remember that. Uh, I remember that very well. I was driving uh, from Catskill home to Brooklyn, New York, and just uh, my wife and I pulled the car off the highway and stopped and cried for a while. Um, you, of course, remember what happened here, which was very oh. important. Yes. You probably ought what to talk happened about here? That. Well, I was in the classroom, standing in front of a class, when the custodian ran down the hall and said, Dr. King has been shot, and I think my face must have frozen or drained or something, because the kids just sat and looked at me. And I was just there, like dumbfounded for a few minutes. And, and the kids, when they see me now, that class, when they see me, they say, Ms. Walla, we never saw a face that acted like your face 
They never saw a face drain of blood. I think I just, my face must have just drained of blood and I was standing there in front of them and they didn't know what was happening. I think I finally got myself together. I walked out of the classroom, walked out on the yard and just walked around the yard a while. And the kids stayed very still because they didn't know what was happening. They knew Dr. Martin Luther King but they couldn't remember, they couldn't remember ever seeing a face that happened to my, I think my face is drained of blood and they had never seen a face act like that. And when they see me now, they say, I remember your face. They will remember that as long as they live. Um, I think it was just a, a brutal shock to me, a brutal shock. But that was the beginning of the scholarship yeah. fund, wasn't it? Well, the kids walked out of the high school <clears throat> New London High School. The kids walked out and the, and the principal and the guidance counselor had to go down to try to get them to go back. My husband went down uh, and talked to them and we set up a scholarship for the youngster who would be voted most like Dr. King. A hundred dollar scholarship it was. And the kids voted. One youngster was black and the runner up was a Jewish boy. Rabbi Goldstein's son, and Rabbi Goldstein's son went home and said to his father, suppose I win, what will the students say? And his father explained to him that Dr. King would be very happy if he won. Uh, but this young man who won is now um, on the staff at Brown University. But that scholarship has grown from one $100 to six $20,000 scholarships we're going to give Thursday night, the 15th, six. That's because the organizations and the community has been very, very generous in contributing to the fund. And people contribute to the fund by just sending a donation to Post Office Box 1308, New London, and we are able to give these scholarships um, because the community has been, the institutions, Pfizer's and the uh, the banks, Connecticut Bank, and uh, all the banks have just been very good. They give $20,000 scholarship. The lady who owns Mystic Village gave us a $20,000 scholarship. So um, Ken Gruby, who was an editor of the day for years and years and years, his youngest daughter, of course, inherited all of his uh, um, wealth. She gives a $20,000 scholarship. So. Um, we have just gone from one $100 scholarship to six. I think the community need to be commended for that, this Amen. community. <clears throat> and while you're talking about it, we might want to talk about the event next Thursday. At Thursday night, it, we will be at the Marriott. Uh, the tickets are $50, and people are still asking me for tickets, and you don't need a ticket. You could just cut that little ad out of the paper and mail your money in. But right now, it's so late, I wouldn't say mail it in, I would say take it down to the day paper. Mary Jane, Mary Jane McGinnis uh, is the treasurer and she collects the funds. So if there's anybody who wants to go now, they should take their money right down to the day paper and call attention to Mary Jane McGinnis. I'm sure they would make arrangements for them. Um, last year we had 700 people. The place was sold out, but this year, Money is like it is everywhere, uh, a bit scarce, and we're not sold out. So, so, there are, yeah. so people can still, so like people get, can still come. And, and I might want to add just a very small aside. Next week, Thinking Green will be on. It'll be a new show, but it will not be live. It'll be pre-taped because we're going to be at the dinner. Uh -huh. um, we're going <clears throat> to be on with Art Costa, and he has um, a guest <clears throat> also, um, Paul Kramer, who's a developer in Rochester, New York, and they're going to talk about economic development. But we're going uh -huh. to tape it on Monday uh -huh. so that we can go to the dinner on, on Thursday. That's great. Now, we only have five minutes left, and I thought maybe you can spend the last five minutes telling people how they can help St. Francis House or get involved in its activities. Well, let me take a minute to finish on the beloved community thing. Okay. Because we... The, a lot of things happened 40 years ago. And one of the things, and the, the scholarship fund was a good outcome. The, one of the bad outcomes was that the, the movement for, for peace and justice broke apart. 
um, the, the, the black power movement arose. A lot of white people went into the peace movement and, and left civil rights. Um, the, the, then gradually, um, di different individual groups, gay rights, uh, women's rights, all kinds of things, all good, all good causes, but they've separated. And oh. so the, we, we thought for the 40th anniversary we would ask, is it possible uh, that we can be coming together again? And, and if we are, do we have in our country and in our city a vision of beloved community that Dr. King would recognize? Uh, and so our contribution to that, and it's a group of people that are interfaith, they're Jews, Muslims, Christians, Unitarians, people of no particular religious commitment, uh, working together to try to figure out ways to, to help people in our city, as well as our country, uh, see the goal of beloved community as what politics is about, instead of what often it seems to be about. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is a Gandhian concept and, and so on. So how can you help St. Francis House? You can send money. Uh, we, we are Franciscans and so we beg. Um, <laughs> Everybody begs. We, we've raised $400,000 to pay for the, the buying and renovation of the two houses and that's all done free and clear now. Uh, it costs us about $60,000 a year to do the work that we do. None of us get paid. Uh, we, we pay for the privilege of being there uh, and, and we, we, we do the work, uh, of all kinds of work. But um, come to on a Friday night, um, not this Friday, but the following Friday. Uh, Anne will be talking about uh, nonviolent economics. Uh, and, and two Fridays from then, uh, Frida Berrigan will be talking about uh, the nuclear disarmament. Uh, mm -hmm. And we're trying to talk about contemplation and resistance, uh, the kind of prayer that centers our lives in order to energize us to engage in the world with everybody else. And the beloved community was King's vision of a kind of world where, where politics is a matter of people pooling their energies to do things for the common good, rather than a conflict between parties or individuals or groups or what have you. And I think it's a da we're at a dangerous stage in our country's yeah. life. Uh, the, the, uh, the kinds of reactions to Mr. Obama that have been happening around across the yeah. summer uh, are, are very, very dangerous. Um, so I won't say anything about local politics, but uh, we need to find ways to, to work together and to have a vision of, of, of what a community is like where people uh, can actually work together for the common good. And again, St. Francis House is at 30 Broad Street, so that's where the events are. Uh, yeah. What would you like to say before we... Well, I'm just hoping that we can come together and think about togetherness rather than separate um, little wars among citizens. Uh, mm -hmm. St. Francis House is all about peace and uh, prayer and helping the neighbor. Um, I, I, I don't want to see New London fall apart. I've, I've learned to love the little city and love the people that are in it. And I want us to come together. I don't care what we want to call it. Uh, whatever you want to call it, you, if you don't want to call it anything, but come together to think about each other as neighbors and feel safe to walk around the city. Um, feel safe to walk anywhere in the city. And St. Francis House is a haven. Um, and, and he grows a fig tree. <laughs> I can't believe that. Do you get figs? He gets yes. figs. He gets figs. But I want peace, and I want challenge, I want competition, but I want peace with it. And I'm just praying for peace. Well, we're out of time. Thank you both for coming on. And um, another 10 years for St. Francis House. Well, you can come back on the show before that. <laughs> but I hope in 10 years also. I hope so. Uh, so for everyone else, I hope we see you at the candidate forums. I hope to see you at um, all of these other events that are going on around the city. And uh, we'll see you next week, sort of, on tape, and be back live in two weeks. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm.